The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Church, we are gathered here this day to worship God and witness our longing for freedom and peace in the world. We celebrate our common faith and ministries, and we honor men and women of this beautiful country who were and are there when character and order have to be rebuilt. Let us be silent in your presence, O Lord. This is our silence in your presence, O oh Lord. May the veterans present here this morning please stand. What do you think? This is the litany of the armed forces from the Book of Worship for the United States forces. Let us give thanks to God for the land of our birth with all its chartered liberties. For all the wonder of our, church, our country story, we give, we give you, you thanks, thanks O oh God. For leaders of nation and state and for those who in days past and, the, and these present times have labored for the commonwealth, we give you thanks, O oh God. For those who in all times and places have been true and brave and in the world's common ways have lived upright lives and ministered to their fellows. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks O oh God. God. For those who served their country in its hour of need and especially for those who gave even their lives in that service. We, we give, give you thanks, thanks O oh God. God. O oh, Almighty God, most merciful Father, as we remember these, your servants, remembering with gratitude their courage and strength, we hold before you those who mourn them. Look upon your bereaved servants with your mercy, as this day brings them memories of those they have lost a while. May it also bring your consolation and the assurance that their loved ones are alive now and forever in your living presence.
Good morning. morning. Welcome. My name is Tim Powell, and it's my privilege to be your worship leader this morning. Uh, For those who haven't already done so, please find the attendance registers in your pew and sign in and pass it down. Everybody sign in, pass it back. Uh, We want to know that you were here. If uh, you have prayer concerns or joys, either one, uh, find the yellow cards in the pew backs. Uh, We have people who would pray for you during the week. Prayer groups that specifically come up here, our pastor will pray for you. If you'd like it to be a confidential, there's a check mark on there. Just put this in the offering plate when it comes around. And if you're an online giver or given any sort of a fashion other than dropping money in the plate. Uh, We've got this card right here in the pew backs that you can place in the plate as it comes by to signify that you are a faithful giver. Um, So this worship leader business, I have no training. Uh, I think I learned what I learned by feeding off of other worship leaders. And the problem with that is they're all different there's not any real real pattern. Everybody has their own theme. And sometimes I come up here with something I wanted to say. Uh, and on the way this morning, I thought of something else to say. So I'm not going to tell you what I was going to say. There might be a day somewhere down the line when I will do it. But today you're not going to get it. Today I just got to thinking about the fact that we're known as a friendly church. And I got to thinking, is that by design or is it by nature? Is that just our nature? And I think it's our nature. Uh, I think it started when this church started. I was a kid in school somewhere, public school, I'm pretty sure at that time. But I'll bet you that this was a friendly church from the start, that it was a welcoming church by nature. And I think we still are that way. So it doesn't take much effort. For us to welcome new members and to to be friendly and to actually have a reputation of that sort. Most people that find their way to this church find their way and stay here because of the way they found us. So please don't hesitate. If you see someone you don't know, uh, be a little bit afraid they've been here before. Don't accuse them of being visitors when they've been here for three months. Uh, <laughs> Try to be thoughtful about the way you approach them. But if you don't know somebody, make sure you don't leave here without knowing them before it's over. Uh, same way with us being a praying church. What church isn't a praying church? Uh, it's about something different about our church that prayer to us is, it's not that other churches couldn't be sincere, but there's just something more about it. Again, it's in our nature. And so thank you for being that kind of a church. It's very important to me to be a part of it, and I hope it is for everyone else. So let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship, and I think it's hallelujah.
Amen. Now will you please stand as you are able so we can sing our first hymn together, My Hope is Built.
or go and find someone and be that friendly church and say, peace be with you. And my name is... Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please hear our offering prayer. Holy God, who calls us to the journey, it's so easy for us to become distracted so that we wander off the path you have put before us. The chaos of the world around us catches our attention, and we neglect the inner journey that keeps us closer to you. As we set aside this time to bring our gifts to you, may you draw our attention back to the wisdom and guidance that you put before us, and may it lead us to endurance that will carry us to kingdom presence. In Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, what a joy to see our Thanksgiving altar already being decorated for, for the holidays coming up and to see our veterans stand and, and to hear the music and, and just be in communion, the saints of today, for the saints of the future and in memory of the ones who've gone before us. Would you pray with me? Lord, it is your day, Sunday, the day where we remember Easter, every Sunday, where we remember that life is stronger than death, that you will have the end of that story, that is still a kind of mixture of clouds and sunshine, of peace and disturbances, of destruction and fear, and then again, joy and confidence. Lord, as we're coming here this morning, singing the old songs and some new ones in the midst, we want your guidance. We want to ask for your forgiveness for things, for moments in our week where we were without you, where we felt we were without you and acted accordingly. That's not how you intended it. You said, walk with me, dance with me, cry with me, whatever is going on in your lives. We got this. So Lord, forgive us. Let us start new this morning on, on a day that we remember life is stronger than death. Christ is risen indeed. And where the church will sing hallelujah and to you be the glory. As your friendly church, we, we lift up the ones who said, could you pray for me? We pray for the people who are in war zones, in, in places where there is no electricity, no water. Where they're struggling to have one safe place. Where families are weak where children are without any guidance, any parents, no protection. 
We're praying for our neighborhood and the global world. We're praying for each one as they're representing here a household for our families, the ones at home, the ones far away, the ones who call us this afternoon and said, we're not going to make it for Thanksgiving and that's okay. And we're praying for the ones on our list, oh God, for Rachel, for the family and friends of Charles, for the family and friends of David, for family and friends of Connie, for Sharon, for Jackie, for Olivia and Galen, for Nancy and Ellen, for Louis and Mike, for Tony and Waltraud, for the United Methodist Church and the world that we are in. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Scripture reading is Isaiah 12. You will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust, and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say on that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you all pray with me? Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. On that day, you will sing praises and shout aloud for joy. You may want to put a little marker in your bulletin where it's written the first verse of chapter 12 of famous prophet Isaiah. On that day, which day? Did you ever think that through? Well, which day is he talking about? Now, as you all studied the Bible, you know that the book, the prophet Isaiah, kind of contains three parts. The, the first part was written before everything was happening, and I'll tell you a little bit in a minute about it. The second part is while they're in the midst of it, and the third part is after they're returning home. And that gives us a topic because they are right there at the first part in the midst of seeing, anticipating what's going to happen right around the corner. The troops are lined up. There is already part of the big kingdom that has fallen. The Assyrians, remember, big enemies. And there's lots of people out there who are just watching and waiting to get the land, to get the people, and that there won't be any more blessing for the future. Remember, that was the promise that God has given to his people in the beginning. And now they are there. They're saying, oh, Babylon is coming. Remember Babylon? And we're going to be deported. Sounds familiar. Sounds like 2022. Evacuated. And we're going to lose our land. This is what's ahead. This is the time that they're talking about before they're going to go all into exile to Babylon slash Iraq, that area over there later. It's been devastating. We're talking 600 before Jesus was born. And that famous people and the land that they finally got and the promise that they'd be great and a blessing for everybody around it is really in danger now. And here's Isaiah. Telling them, I said, this is the prophet talking to you. This is what's about to happen. It's right there. We can see it already. It's on Facebook. It's in the news. They didn't have that back then. 
and not a good situation. And the problem we have right now is that he's not writing this down on that day when we will return to this place. Oh yeah, one day everything's going to be all right again, this kind of thing. No. He says, on that day, on our day today, where we're seeing that something is coming and it's not going to be good for everybody, I will call you all to do what? Shout for joy. Sing praises to the Lord. Bless his holy name. Really now? I compare it with moments. You know that you have a surgery scheduled for middle of December. And we don't know how it's going to go. The clouds hanging right there, right? We can go realistic. We know that there's troops lining up somewhere in Europe that's not so far away. And it just takes one or two people to push the wrong button. And there's going to be catastrophe ahead. Let's name it. Oh, there's going to be something happening there. And we don't know how the outcome is. Someone is telling me maybe it's worse to wait and to see the danger ahead of us, that cloud's just lingering there, and we're not going to know. It's like listening to the weather podcast when they say the hurricane is coming with Florida, right? It could be three or four. We're not quite sure where it's going to hit land. And you're just waiting. On that day, you shall sing joy. You shall praise his name. That's Isaiah. He's talking about that first part before everything's happening that's right in front of us. Why, Isaiah? I would be the one who would say, well, let's, let's find shelter and, and get a little supply of water and, and, and do our uh, last will, maybe, or, or call that loved one and tell him one more time, I love him. None of that in Isaiah. He says, no, your job right now is to shout for joy and sing praises to the Lord. Really now, yeah. Well, that's a different concept. <laughs> and either you could say, well, maybe Isaiah is a little bit uh, schizophrenic at that time. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, Isaiah. Yeah. <laughs> or his heart is not as security-driven, conservative as my heart I would look for what can we do, right? Not praise God, do a little bit more salsa dancing like last week. Forget that part. <laughs> yeah. Sing. Be joyful. Praise God. On that day, while you're waiting for evil, destruction is going to hit you right there. Why? And it almost feels a little bit, for the ones of us who've been here last week, that he was listening to us as we were preaching last Sunday. When we learned something about Psalm 145, the whole psalm sounds a little bit like maybe he was singing it. Remember, it was a songbook back then of what Isaiah is writing down there. Huge shift in his book, by the way. The first 11 chapter is one thunderstorm and realistic description of what's going on right now after the next you should read it if you don't want to go to the movie and want to watch a thriller. Just read Isaiah 1 to 11 with a couple of exemptions. He's lying it out there. And now in chapter 12, he's switching. He said, just be happy. <laughs> Sing for joy. Loud. Why? It seems like he's listening to what we understood last Sunday about Psalm 145, that there is not a trick, but that there is a spiritual discipline that God is asking us throughout the whole Bible, that when you are even in anticipation of something bad is happening, you are there to bless God, right? Lift up his name. And we asked the question, do you remember, he said, why does God need to be blessed? Nice job, God, right? We exalt your name. He's already tall and big and more powerful than I think we have. But we learned last Sunday, remember, that blessing means we reveal his story. Apocalypsein is the word for it in Greek. We're taking away the whale that is hanging over everything, and we're just going to lay it out and open it up. This is still your creation, O oh God. Let it be known. 
this is what's happening. And no fear, and not like, oh, we, we shouldn't talk about that, you know, and there's children in the room. Yeah, it may get a little rough, but it's not that bad. Blessing God means to reveal his general revelation as the creator of heaven and earth, period. And that's what he's asking the people to do there. This is not uh, uh, sing a happy clappy song, you know. I'm singing in the rain. Not this thing either, right? It's not about like, it's not that bad. Everybody be relaxed, right? Joy. They're there. I can see them coming over the mountains. They're already getting the children and the wives, our land, all that crop that we just planted. It's going to be gone. Think about it. That was our land. We lived for it all our lives. I don't know what they're going to do to us in Iraq. Shout for joy in the midst of it. Bring out the blessings. Reveal God's claim. No, let's say acknowledge what God has claimed his own in the midst of destruction and threats of destruction coming up. Lay it out. We can handle it. What may happen? It's okay. One after the next. You can say if you define that monster, every mom knows that with a little toddler, right? If you know exactly what's crawling under that bed that you can't sleep at night, it already gets smaller. Oh, it's just that shadow from my toy over there. This is real stuff. Name it. Reveal God's name, bless his name, general revelation. This is what we are in right now for. This is our prayer list, right? Look at the list. There's maybe three joys in there, and the rest is a long list of this is what's happening right now. Document it. Don't be afraid of it. Don't cover it up. Apocalypse, and it's the apocalypse coming. It's general revelation. But in the midst of it, we are acknowledging. God claims it's still his own because he made it. And that would be okay, but he's taken us a step further. If you have your scripture in front of us, look to verse 6. It's giving us a little hint in our young adult Bible study. They caught it and it says, shout for joy, sing good songs to our Lord as he is the royal of Zion. You know what royal means. Royal means anointed, right? Only the king gets oil on his forehead. Anointed means Messiah. Messiah means Greek, Christos. And there we already were talking about there is a special revelation coming in the midst of what's ahead of us and what's absolutely real. Blessing God in the midst of what we are going to encounter in a little while comes with, we're going to see it through the special revelation of Jesus Christ, the royal of Zion, who will come in his place. What does it mean? It means pretty much that we are looking already through the eyes. We're very fortunate of after Jesus Christ died, was buried, resurrected, and said, I am alive and you shall live also. We're looking through these eyes while we're still waiting what's going to happen in history, not afraid to name it. Jesus Christ with his cross, God working through his son, to telling whatever destruction, whatever stupidity, whatever pride is ruling this world and will go and bring its row of what history does to you, is not the end. Jesus Christ is going to turn it upside down. If we're blessing God through the special revelation that says, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed in the midst of what we are about to experience very soon, we already know how it's supposed to look like in the end. Do you see what that means? We're turning everything upside down. Yes, but. Christ is risen in the midst of it. Yes, but. He said we shall live and we shall have our land back and our families back and be a promise to everybody. This is the special revelation. Praise God. Shout for joy. It's almost like a demonstration song in the midst of it. Despite of what we're about to experience, we're counting on the cross. Jesus Christ, show us how it's going to look like when you came through. And he will. Someone told me when they were children, it was like this WWGD, you know, what would Jesus do? Yeah. 
Maybe we should turn this braces around and say it's not anymore that question. What would Jesus Christ, what would Jesus do? But what would Jesus Christ be in the midst of what is about to happen already? Turning the world upside down. Yes, it's bad. It's going to be bad, but we're going to turn it around. Otherwise, it would be just decoration, the cross up there. We had this uh, celebration of life on, on Monday. And after everybody was out there, suddenly I see this young man walking here through the building. He, he could have been my son. He's in his 30s. And you could get from, from the look, he's, he, it's, he's been outside for a long time. He hadn't had a shower in a long time. It was rough. He was deeply disturbed and said, how did you get in here? <laughs> And, and he startled, and then I took him outside, and he said, I'm looking for that pastor. And I said, yeah. He said, there was this friendly pastor seven years ago, and, and he talked to me, and he helped me. And I said, well, that friendly pastor is gone. Now you're stuck with me. Yeah? <laughs> and then he uh, told me his story and how sad it is right now. And he found his way back here. And I turned it around, what I always do, you can count on it. I said, what do you have that I don't have? What's your strength, son? And he couldn't understand the question for a long time. And he was searching around there. He wanted to tell me how hard and how terrible everything is. And said, what do you have that I don't have? What are you good at? And then his face changed a little, but I can still see it in front of me. And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a writer. I write. I said, what do you write? And he says, I, I write science fiction. I said, don't you want to start writing the real story? You know how it's going to look like? Because I don't think that God intended you to show up here again seven years later with the same story. It's harsh, you know me. Yeah. Don't you want to write the real story? How it's going to look through special revelation. How it's going to look like when Jesus Christ died for you. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Even for you. Let's call him Mr. Tony. So that you don't need to show up here anymore. Coming in through the back door of a funeral. And telling us and looking for a friendly pastor. But that you'll be in ministry yourself. God has a plan. And then the tears were rolling. And he was crying and I was crying. That's reading it already through even what's going on right now about what God has planned in Jesus Christ. He didn't die for nothing on that cross. Bless his name. As you're anticipating, as you're waiting for more disasters to strike, we're going to look through the eyes of someone who believes in Easter today. Amen. But it gets more interesting. I can't let you off the hook. It would be too easy. Isaiah is rough on us. He's putting us to work. <laughs> He's not going to say, well, this is just write a new story. It's not storytelling time. It's getting to work time. One of the key verses in this Isaiah 12 is, let's get to work. You will draw from the well of salvation. Did you catch that verse? It's somewhere in the midst of it. You will draw from the well of salvation. And as you New Mexicans know, we need, we need water, right? We need life elixir so that we can live and have life everlasting. Mr. Tony needs it too to write a real story, not science fiction, not another sad story. You will draw from the well of salvation. You need water. And unfortunately, I wish so much I could write that Isaiah again for you. It's not about that silly little cloud that would just God be sent by God as we're anticipating next disasters to struck. And then we said, perfect cloud, right, right over here. And it's going to be that warm spring rain and it's going to water my beautiful little daisies and then we're good and the story is written. That's not how it goes. He's putting us to work. He's telling us you need to draw that bucket 
from the well of salvation. Anybody remembers how it is when you draw water with a bucket from a well? Anybody grew up on areas like that? Steve, is that, is that easy to do? Two fingers? Yeah. Lonnie, it's, yeah, it's, it's, hard hard, it's hard to do. Thank you. Even a youngster, Robert, you said it in our young adult Bible study, right? Said you need both hands and your head and your whole body. You need to draw it so that you get water out of it. You will draw from the well of salvation. It's connected with, with a lot of work, engagement. But what we learned in our study again is, it, it's again not a little cloud like, thank you, you know. Ta-da. It comes out of the depth. Listen to that one. It comes out of a hole. I only remember wells that I looked in as a child, and I thought it was super scary. Don't fall in, right? What if you fall in and nobody can get you out? What if you get swallowed up and it's dark, you can't even see the water? The message Isaiah has given his people right there is, you need to go even to the darkest, 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 deepest holes in your life. The scary parts. And you with all your two hands and your head and your whole body, you will draw water because God's salvation is deeper than any dark spots in your life. Did you hear me, church? That's amazing. Go right in there. Don't fall in. But stand close to it. General revelation. And wait for the special revelation to come up. And it's going to take sometimes a little bit. Bring all the engagements in there. Not to be afraid of it. And bless the Lord. So that you can drink from the well of salvation. It's not this turning on a hose. It's engagement. But if there's one spot, one dark spot in your life where I said, I'm not going to go close to it, you can be assured from now on the wells, plural, of salvation are deeper and God's salvation is underneath anything that can intimidate, scare you, take you away from God. Claiming God's revelation in Jesus Christ who has said and told us this there, I'm alive and you shall live also. Draw. Go underneath all of it and you will find the water of salvation that will give you life. Even if you're going to be deported to Iraq, right there. It takes practice. It takes repetition. Going back to that funeral on Monday, some of us have been there. The celebration of life, it was powerful. But what really sticked with me the whole week, we had military honors after the celebration here in the sanctuary. So we went outside. And I thought, I know that because I was trained in Arlington Cemetery in D.C. with beautiful liturgies there. But we were standing there for a long time, did you notice? (laughs) And I thought, what are they doing? And they were unfolding the flag. And then they were folding it this beautiful way. I could watch that all day. But then something funny happened, or it wasn't funny, but it was strange. They were unfolding it again. And I thought, is this a New Mexican thing? Gary, is this special here? <laughs> oh, you never know what you get in New Mexico, right? No, they had done it wrong. They told me later. And the last guy, excuse me, I don't know how to say it right, he checked. And the flag was not folded exactly the right way. I would have been tempted. I would have covered it up and said, we'll fix it later. Let's go on, right? Nobody would have noticed. But they unfolded everything again. We were standing out there forever. Right, Charlene? Yeah. To do it right. And when it was right, and it was folded right, they handed it to the widow. This is... What the discipline is called, why Isaiah is hitting on it. On that day, while we're still anticipating what's going to happen one day, we're going to practice it. We're going to draw from that well until you get that water. And if the bucket is empty the first time, don't worry. Just let it down again and try. 
Blessed be the Lord. Not afraid. Not, it's not working. Of course it is. It's Jesus Christ after all. So how do we end up in these sermons always with a lot of work for you all? You, you must be preaching something wrong. One day I promise I'm going to give you a sermon where you just go out and say all is well with the world. Right? It's your fault. Right? I'm just preaching what's in your heart. But here is the really good news and I don't have much time left. It's a story that everything happened on Monday after this funeral that I'm relating to today. We had, we had a family dinner as so we're trying to have it every night. And it was a, a little bit of a disturbed one. No, it started really good. We, we found another one of our treasures in my famous containers. We found the icon that we've been missing for a long time, icon of, of Mary. And it is, uh, you can look at it later and come up. It's from Ephesus in Turkey, and we found it in our treasure chest, and we were talking about how we went to Ephesus and how the guy who was selling it to us didn't want to show us that one. <laughs> it was in the back of his store, but we loved it, and George was very insistent, said, no, we need that one. Mary, she's, she's another one of those to proclaim and bless his name before she knows what storm's coming her way. Absolutely. Magnificat, right? And she didn't see much Magnificat in her life. Anyway, so we're putting this icon on the wall. We found the perfect spot. Then we're sitting down for dinner. And our uh, powerful family, three boys, I'm sorry, dad, two boys, and myself, <laughs> are there to um, share around the room what happened. There was a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. Mary, can you hold the offering, please? See, it's not heavy enough. Okay. Okay. Anyway, and so everybody is like, it's too much. I'm scared of this. And at least we laid it out there, but we didn't have a solution. And then we're getting up. Mom gets to do the dishes, and one has homework. The other one wants to write a little review. And uh, so they're going off in their rooms, and suddenly I hear Dad screaming. Now. Not everybody here knows George Miller, but he never screams. <laughs> and it was a scream I've never heard before, but I will never forget that scream. And then he says only one word, and he says, snake. <coughs> and it wasn't funny. He says it was two feet long. I think it was two and a half feet long. It was a rattler, a rattlesnake in our hallway. And I swear it was on the other side of that wall where we had just put up that icon. Now what you do? And I wish it would not have happened, right? Do you know these moments when you're in the middle of the shock? And they said, can we just think it away? <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it's not going to happen. Exile's not going to happen. I, I'm not going to go there. It's, it's, it, we're just out of this thing. But it was there, obviously. So what do you do? So we're going through all these wonderful friends that I can think of in the middle of my shock, right? George, you keep an eye on that rattlesnake. Dog outside. Boys, we have a snake in the house. And on and on. Right? Everybody's hyper. So animal control is not reachable. This is a late dinner. We're talking 8.30 at night. And one of my wonderful friends, oh, I'll call 911, right? And one of us says, well, let's go. And there is the snake rattle uh, wrestlers, yeah? There's some phone numbers, so I'm getting some phone numbers. The first one's out of town, second one doesn't answer, and the third one answers. And from the voice that I hear on that phone, I know this is not his first rodeo and rattlesnake that he would have ever caught in his life. But he's on the other end of town, and his car has broken down, and there's no way he can come out. Why I'm sharing it with you is, of course, to show off my wonderful family. Um, but he kept us on the phone, and he talked with George for a few minutes, and he said, you know, the way you sound, I think you can handle this. Whew, right? And I said, no, no, don't touch it, don't go anywhere, right? All you need is, do you know what you need? You need a broom and a bucket with a lid. Jane, have you done that before? 
put a rattlesnake away. You need to know where I come from. We don't have snakes, okay? <laughs> so my job was to be in the kitchen, watch all these circus going on there, and talk to the guy on the phone. And he stayed on that phone with us for 35 minutes until mission accomplished. He said, it's easy. You need to take that broom and you just, they're afraid of you. You need to push it closer to that bucket, right? And then you put a towel around the bucket. I know everything. If you ever have a rattlesnake, put it in my job description, Shelly. <laughs> pastor. She's not the nice pastor, but she knows rattlesnakes, yeah. And then you try to push it in there and the man stayed on the phone with us forever. He said, no, yeah, if she's putting her head up like that, you need to watch a little bit, and then, yep, you're, and I tried to explain it, and Johanna said, don't scream in the phone, that man didn't do anything to you. <laughs> <laughs> but he stayed calm, he said, yeah, that's right, now one step further. End of story, a rattlesnake is now all the way up in Oregon Mountain, nobody got bit, and we are five centimeters taller, all of us. What has that to do with Isaiah? If we bless God's name, if we have draw from the well of salvation, if we know that whatever is ahead of us, how dark that cloud looks like, and we don't know the outcome of it, we already, through Jesus Christ's eyes, can always say, how has it supposed to be look like in the end? And until then, he will walk us through on that phone. He's not going to let go of us. He said, now you push a little bit over here. Get that evil out of the house. Put Mary in the right place. Right? Bless his name. We were finishing it in our young adult Bible study and said, that's an exhausting job to bless his name. No matter what's ahead of you in your lives right now. But one of us in that young couple Bible study, she lived in the Philippines right now. So we had an easy solution. He said, and when I need to go to bed, because you can't push that broom forever and get the snakes and the evil and the threats out of the house. You can't draw all night from that water, especially if it's hard work. But you have someone else who will take over. Rachel, would you continue? And it was 10 o'clock her time, and it was 8.30 my time in the evening. That's what church does. Don't tell me anymore about the problem of a church. What does the United Methodist Church do in the future? We're going to bless God's name. We're going to take the broom and get the snakes out. We're going to look through the eyes of Easter, how it's supposed to look like in the end. And when we are tired and we can need a break, that someone else, Rachel in the Philippines, will take over until she needs a rest and will continue. That's church. And the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, forgive us, we're going over time, but the coffee is made and the Sunday schools are waiting, but we know what we have to do now. And we know we don't have to do it by ourselves or on our own, but you will do it through the communion of saints. That your name be glorified. We will sing for joy. If it sounds sometimes a little bit hysteric, like me on the phone with a snake wrestler on the other side of town. But the job will be done because you're in charge. We will claim the cross and the resurrection. No destruction, no stupidity, no pride will ever get in the way so that you finish your kingdom. And in the midst of it, on that day, while we're still waiting and say, more is coming, we're not afraid. We're going to go right back to the depth, wherever we feel like this is dark down there, and see the water of salvation underneath it all, to you the glory. Amen. Will you please stand, and we'll sing our last hymn of the morning.
You may be seated. I'm just going to stay over here instead of walking over there. Every year, the University of Methodist women have the honor of recognizing those people in our congregation that go over and above. Today, I'm going to honor two people. And second service will honor some more. I want to tell you about these two people. They're very special. They have stepped up when we were in need of praise and worship. They stepped up when we were sitting outside in the wind and the, and the, and the rain and doing uh, all of our singing outside during COVID. They have blessed the choir in more ways than you will ever know. And they bless you every single Sunday morning. I would like to honor Bev and Beverly Rhodes right now with a special recognition hymn. Would you please come up here? We're very blessed and very honored that they have decided to be our fearless leaders in choir. So please, honor these special people with your love, your devotion, and your clapping once more. Amen. Thank you. Mr. Bill? Stay with us as we're... No, you're ready, right? Because we have to hear music after the blessing. <laughs> Way over time. Tom Bartlett promised me he would cut me short. Where is he? No. It's all Tom's fault. Here he is. Three announcements quick. Number one, out there is beautiful posters prepared by the preschool who just want to say thank you for everybody who participated, was present, was very active at the fall festival. And they just want to thank you because all the proceeds went to scholarships for more children to join them in our beautiful school. Number two, if you have nothing to do on Tuesday evening, 4.30, 4.30 is round table. Everybody who is interested in ministries, and so I don't know what they do there, come and see it. There we share and throw a little bit the puzzle pieces back and forth to see what's going to happen there and share more about the future and the vision where this church is going to strive into. And number three, if you see any, anybody who says, I need communion during the month and, or I need to just talk to a pastor and ensure that the pastor is available and you can call me outside the office hours and I will answer if I'm in a meeting or not available right now and then we'll wrestle some snakes together, okay? Communion is available during the year, during the weeks also, not just on the first of the month. And now receive God's blessing for this beautiful day. May the Lord watch over your comings in and goings out from this day on and forevermore in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.